Well, thank, thank you so much, Professor Mota and uh, Professor Usashi Guha. A wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, uh, just one small clarification, I'm now Professor Emeritus at Radford University. I retired uh, last spring. <laughs> and uh, now I work full time with uh, the World Constitution and Parliament Association. Um, in the in the, the charter of global ecological responsibilities that i worked on with the committee from children now which is located in montreal canada um it uh uh is posted on my website at oneworldrenaissance.com and my paper that i'm about to present today is also posted there and they're under this section called Glenn's blog and they're the first items there. And it's important if you haven't read the charter, uh, it's right there, you can read it on my blog. And then this paper, which is critical, which is a critical analysis uh, is there as well. And I think that's a particularly important because my paper makes some very strong statements and uh, it has footnotes throughout. And of course, in my presentation, I will not go over the footnotes, but you can go to oneworldrenaissance.com and look at the, the citations for the paper, the footnotes, so that you can see where I have documented my, my claims and the, the, the intellectual background for the paper. Okay, with that being said, let me, uh, let's turn to the paper. The Charter of Global Ecological Responsibilities is being promoted worldwide to the United Nations, to governments, to media organizations, and to the public. I personally helped with the writing of the Charter as part of the Children Now Committee that developed it. Uh, this came from a symposium that we gave on the environment last summer. Uh, it was uh, an online Zoom symposium, but it, it had a number of very important thinkers on the environment contributed to that symposium. Uh, I also helped with its promotion by narrating a two minute video advertisement featuring the charter. The charter is concise, directed and powerful in its focus. In this presentation, I would like to go over certain key features of the charter and ask the question about what else what else must change? What must be the civilizational background, the structural changes, if the claims of responsibilities of the Charter are to be actualized? The Charter envisions an ideal. This ideal is presupposed uh, throughout, but is expressed explicitly in its introduction and its conclusion. The introduction reads, quote, as a global society that should be founded on respect for nature, concern for present and future generations, universal human rights, economic justice, and a culture of peace, it is imperative that we declare our responsibility to one another, to our planet as a living whole, and to future generations." Unquote. Very good. Right. Similarly, in the conclusion of the Charter, it reads, quote, For it is only as a global community acting in concert that we can protect and restore our precious planet for the dignity of all persons and the flourishing of future generations, unquote. How do we become a global community? Within the framework of the ideals expressed in the introduction and conclusion, we find a statement of a, a statement of purpose, a preamble, and five articles detailing specific responsibilities. The responsibility of businesses, the responsibility of governments, the responsibility of parents and educators, the responsibility of individuals, and the responsibility of the media. The details of these sections articulating specific responsibilities are meant to help actualize the ideals given in the introduction and conclusion. How do we actualize, quote, a global community acting in concert on behalf of the dignity of all persons and future generations, unquote. 
This question is fundamental. However, the creators of this excellent charter were faced with a dilemma. Uh, this is fundamental, I think, this dilemma. In today's world, there is always a dilemma between the need to make ideas more popular and hence influence change in this way and the need to make ideas penetrating, critical, and illuminating. The more penetrating and critical ideas become, the less they will conform to the dominant ideology and popular opinion. And the more they will be marginalized or ignored by the media and man mainstream thought. The dilemma, of course, impacts this charter. In, in it, we attempted to say something as real and meaningful as possible, and yet at the same time influence as many people and leaders as possible. There is no correct solution to this dilemma. The more penetrating and honest about a system one becomes, the more ignored and marginalized they are likely to be. Each article in the char charter involves a compromise in the face of this dilemma. Below, I will select one or two specific responsibilities from each of the categories within the charter as examples. I will treat articles one, three, four, and five first and leave article two on the responsibility of governments to the last. In each case, I will examine whether the ideals of the introduction and conclusion can really be actualized by the responsibilities given in these five categories. Or is there something missing? Are there untenable assumptions being made that need supplementing with an adequate structural analysis of the world system being addressed by the charter? Article one on the responsibility of businesses declares that business must quote, reduce, reuse, and recycle natural resources, unquote. They must quote, manage natural resources efficiently, unquote. And they must, quote, prioritize the well-being of people and the planet, unquote. The background to these statements of responsibility is, of course, global capitalism. Almost everywhere on our planet, global capitalism is the enforced norm. It is enforced by the world's greatest imperial superpower, which act actively attacks any country that attempts to establish a socialist alternative from guatemala and iran in 1953 and 54 to vietnam during the 1960s to the soviet union for many decades to chile after 1970 to nicaragua during the 1980s to the former yugoslavia during the 1990s to cuba and venezuela today and those examples are just some of the most famous one the tip of the iceberg everywhere on the planet, the global superpower is attempting to enforce capitalism and destroy the credibility of socialism. The capitalism that is forced upon the world requires competition among businesses and governments for resources, markets, and also among governments themselves. The competition among businesses is for the private profit on behalf of investors. The company management is, within the USA legal system, even required by law to act so as to maximize the profit for investors. Understand this? By law, in the United States, a company must act to maximize the profit for its investors. Uh, the notion of efficiency of capitalism you know, that's what the, the responsibility says, that, that businesses should use resources efficiently. But the notion of efficiency in capitalism does not mean, as the Charter of Responsibilities assumes, the careful use of resources so as to minimize, minimize waste and overuse. Efficiency under capitalism means cutting labor costs, acquiring materials and other production costs so cheaply in order to maximize profit for investors. It has little or nothing to do with the use of, uh, careful use of scarce resources. If ExxonMobil, the giant oil company, ExxonMobil, for example, poisons the jungles of Ecuador 
while sickening and causing the deaths of the indigenous peoples in the area of its mining operations, as actually happened in the, this very famous case. You can Google it on, online. Under capitalism, this is precisely efficiency. For the profits of investors are increased to the extent that that money is not wasted on protecting or repairing the environment around its mining operations. In sum, Article 1 of the re on the responsibility of businesses lacks a critical analysis, <clears throat> excuse me, a critical analysis of the economic system that it is addressing, addressing with its exhortation of responsibilities. Let us take one more example, the famous Bhopal disaster of the Union Carbine Company in India on December 4th, 1984 in which 46.3 tons of deadly poisonous methyl isocyanate gas escaped, causing the deaths of 8,000 people that night, with some 500,000 more, more injured, and some 50 to 70,000 of those injuries permanent. In his book, The Enemy of Nature, The End of Capitalism or the End of the World, philosopher Joel Covell describes the background for this accident. Now, the accident, remember, took place in 1984. This account starts in 1982, he says. The plant was losing money because the demand for pesticides was down. This led to an effort to cut costs beginning in 1982. Such cuts meant less stringent quality control and thus looser safety rules. They could do with less, including they used instruction manuals in English, which few people working at the plant could even read. By not late 1984, only six operators, rather than the original 12, were working with this deadly gas. The numbers of supervisory personnel had also been halved. And while there was no maintenance supervisor at all on the night shift, that's when this took place, during the night shift, Thus, indicator readings were checked only every two hours rather than hourly as required. You see, this is capitalist efficiency. If you're losing money, you've got to maximize profit for your investors, you cut costs, you cut safety regulations, and so on. How are we going to protect the environment under this system? The Bhopal disaster was not some unpredictable, bizarre accident. It ultimately was caused by the very essence of capitalism the need to maximize profit by cutting costs, that is by efficiency, at the expense of both people and the environment. The Charter of Ecological Responsibilities never mentions the word capitalism. It, the ideals it expresses in its introduction and conclusion, it is assumed, can be actualized through the specific responsibilities identified in its five articles. But now we see that there is an immense cognitive disjunction here. Perhaps this is a difficulty that all people of goodwill face who want to protect our global environment and future generations. Right? We all want to protect the global environment, but can we do it under the current world system? The responsibilities attributed to businesses are incongruent with the real structural and institutional demands on businesses. Capitalism structurally demands, structurally, institutionally, legally, often legally, demands that profits be pursued regardless of people or the environment. And that is why the subtitle of Covell's book is, quote, the end of capitalism or the end of the world, unquote. There are many excellent books making this same point, some cited in the end notes to this article. Critical analysis of the system is ignored by the charter, perhaps necessarily, because if it wants to become popular, if you want this to be read by world leaders and so on, by the UN, you can't include a criticism of the system. Article 3 on the responsibility of parents and educators makes the excellent point that, quote, global citizenship and the sense of planetary responsibility, unquote, must be promoted. It declares that youth must be educated to be critical thought leaders. And thus, parents and educators must instill real understanding of the limits of economic growth 
as well as planetary population growth. Important because the salient points reflect the scientific consensus today that growth, uh, that infinite growth on a finite planet is impossible. Yes? Uh, and these, this consensus is reflected in books on ecological economics, such as Herman E. Daly's book, Beyond Growth, The Economics of Sustainable Development, Donella Meadows' book, The Limits to Growth, the 30-year update, came out in 2004, and Richard Heinberg's, Bird's book, Heinberg's book, The End of Growth, Adapting to Our New Economic Reality, that came out in 2011. The charter was written with the very important understanding that you cannot have endless growth on a finite planet. And Article 3 apparently wants parents and educators to instill this understanding into our young people. But there is a, an important qualification in the words of Richard Heinberg, quote, we have created monetary and financial systems that require growth. As long as the economy is growing, that means more money and credit are available, expectations are high, people buy more goods, businesses take out more loans, and the interest on existing loans can be repaid. The end of growth is a very big deal indeed. It means the end of an era and our current ways of organizing economies politics, and daily life. A whole paradigm change needs to take place. It needs to be the end of the era of growth and therefore of capitalism. The end of growth, therefore, necessarily means the end of capitalism. Under capitalism, businesses and individuals take loans from banks on the assumption that growth in income will be such that loans can be repaid with interest. If there's no growth, there's no loans, right? All of this has to change. Similarly, nations estimate their economic success today according to the growth of GDP, the gross domestic product. And nations themselves take out development loans from such imperial sources as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. By the end, uh, but the end of the growth imperative that is destroying our planetary ecosystem means the end of the entire cycle of investments, loans, growth, and repayments. No more debt-based monetary system. No more investments with expectations of return and profit. No more development loans to be paid back through the growth of a business. No more measuring success for governments as increase in GDP. As Herman E. Daly suggests, insists, capitalism must be replaced by a steady state economy based not on quantitative measurements of success with growth, extra, extraction of resources and profits, but on the quality of life and harmony with the natural environment. Right? That is what we, that's what's implied in what we have to teach our children, I would suggest. Right? We have to teach them, teach them, when it says we have to teach them harmony with the natural environment, that means they have to learn to live in terms of a quality of life that is not measured in how much money I'm making, how much success I'm taking in terms of uh, my income and so on. Quality of life means awakening. It means illumination. It's what the Buddhists have been talking about or the uh, Swami Agnovich was talking about. Article four of the charter of individuals says we must emphasize, quote, our collective right to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment, unquote, and that we must learn to, quote, think and act holistically as global citizens within a sustainable world civilization. Think and act holistically as global citizens. The, these are indeed important responsibilities, along with the responsibilities that we ourselves make lifestyle changes to reduce as much as possible our carbon footprint. Are these impediments to, are there impediments to our having our collective right to a healthy environment recognized? Are there structural and cultural impediments to our thinking 
holistically as global citizens? Indeed, there are. The Charter of Ecological Responsibilities was intentionally kept as succinct as possible in order to provide an effective guide and a powerful statement. It is not a philosophical treatise, nor should it be. Nevertheless, the analysis of the world system dominated by global capitalism and militarized sovereign nation states would seem also to be an imperative if we are to think holistically and advocate for our collective right to a healthy environment. Does the dominant world system fragment our thought and action? Does it inherently deny our collective rights? Think of the Russia Ukraine and the world outrage in one way or another for or against this thing. Is that holistic thinking? Does that impair our ability to think as global citizens on one planetary civilization? The UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted on December 10, 1948 does not mention any collective right to a healthy environment even though this may be implied in such affirmations as Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Clearly, life, liberty, and security of person require a healthy environment even to be possible. However, the UN Universal Declaration is binding on no nations. It has zero enforcement mechanisms. In the light of this, Article 28 of the UN Universal Declaration may in some ways be the most important. It says, quote, everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. The Charter of Ecological, Ecological Responsibilities, in part because of the dilemma mentioned above, does not mention the social and international order of the world into which it projects its list of responsibilities. But clearly our entire world system violates Article 28 of the Declaration. There have been some 150 wars since that declaration was passed and human rights of hundreds of millions of people have been violated and continue to be violated. And our planetary environment is well on the way to being destroyed forever. We need a new world system. The UN Declaration is just another set of ideals with no means of enforcement. We need a world system that actualizes and enforces our environmental and human rights. The Charter of Ecological Responsibilities gives us a coherent set of responsibilities for businesses, educators, individuals, and media, but I argue that the most fundamental responsibility of all is to actualize a new world system that gives us a social and international order in which our rights and freedoms can indeed be fully realized. We don't have that system right now. The world system not only fails to fulfill the entire list of rights in the Universal Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it also actively is destroying our planetary ecosystem. If we truly educate our children as critical thinkers, they will recognize this. We must also educate them for the courage to say and do what is unpopular and forbidden by the dominant system. Without young leaders who can do this, the new system will never emerge. Article 5 on the responsibility of media tells us that the media must, quote, for foster planetary perspectives and global consciousness, unquote. But the dominant media are primarily capitalists. Their job is not to impart truth, but to make a profit for the owners. In the light of what we have seen above then, it is next to impossible for the media to give us truth about the environment or to foster planetary perspectives. Lies can be more profitable than truth, especially if the truth is frightening, as is climate collapse. Glossing over and trivializing environmental problems is much more profitable and vast economic interests like the oil industry or the weapons industry do not want us to know the truth about climate collapse 
and their roles in exacerbating it. They spend many millions of dollars because we have a capitalist media, you can invest in lies on that media. They spend many millions of dollars using the media to block and suppress the truth. The media have been an instrument of the capitalist oligarchy that actually runs our so-called democracies of the world going back into the 1920s. Helen Caldicott, in her book, If You Love This Planet, has an excellent chapter on the history of the movement when the ruling classes of these countries first realized the power of the mass media for control of the minds of people. Noam Chomsky also has done classic studies of the capitalist media and its destructive consequences on democracy in such books as Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies, and is a, another book, Media Control, the Spectacular Achievements of Propaganda. The bottom line is that if we want to inform the world their ecological responsibilities, an idealistic set of responsibilities such as that contained in the Charter of Ecological Responsibilities may have a chance of being promoted by the mass media as long as it does not question the structural background of the world system that blocks progress toward genuine sustainability. Here we have a, a dilemma, right? If you criticize the system, you won't get popular, but the system itself is blocking progress toward genuine sustainability. I make the argument in a detailed form, this argument in a detailed form with regard to the UN Sustainable Development Goals in chapter six of my new book called The Earth Constitution Solution Designed for a Living Planet. The name of the game in the capitalist media is not truth, but what is today called infotainment. Profit does not come from facing hard truths or even revealing the failed structure of the world system. It comes from sensationalism, appealing to emotions, sexual innuendo, and whatever people want to eagerly consume as entertainment. Truth does not matter to capitalism, nor to the system of militarized sovereign states. Again, we see that the Charter faces an uphill battle in its quest to inspire the world to protect the Earth and future generations. Finally, there is Article 2 of the Charter, the responsibilities of government. It states that governments must invest in initiatives for adapting to climate change. They must protect oceans and forests. They must protect the rights of every individual to a healthy environment. They must promote global cooperation, hold local and international businesses accountable, and establish principles of greenhouse gas reduction. The Charter says nothing about the global war system, however. Nothing about the 1.9 trillion US dollars spent annually by the nations of the world on militarism and wars. And nothing about the ongoing slaughter of tens of millions of people in the endless wars since the conclusion of World War II. The capitalist propaganda system has now migrated into a vast cyber warfare system run by all the big imperial governments. Sound bits, social media, calculated distortions, lies, trumped up charges, character assassinations, nationalist propaganda, and slander fly back and forth across the world in billions of postings per day. All the big nations have an entire division of their governments systematically, systematically projecting this propaganda into cyberspace. U.S. and China, Russia certainly have these. Capitalism is not the only culprit in the propaganda system. The other main criminal culprit is the system of sovereign nation states and giant propaganda and media, media wars with, these, with other such sovereign states. The territorial bound system of militarized sovereign nation states is inherently a war system. And therefore, there cannot be real truth in the world, nor any effective dealing with climate collapse as long as this system is in existence. Right? And the war is carried on 
not just hot war like in the Ukraine, but the war is con- continually carried on as as it points out here as cyber war, as propaganda war, as economic wars, economic struggles between China and the U.S. for markets and so on. There, it's a war system. So the war system in the world and the capitalist system go hand in hand. The most profitable businesses on earth is the weapons manufacturing business. The actions most destructive of the environment on earth are wars and the immense polluting and unecological production of ever more weapons encouraged and supported by the fossil fuel industries. A major struggle in today's world, which is named economic warfare, is the conflict between the USA, Russia, and China, and other big nations over markets, investments, and forms of economic integration. On all of this, the Charter of Ecological Responsibilities is perhaps necessarily silent. Popularity and honesty do not go together in this system. The Charter is therefore very much like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or like the famous Earth Charter that can be found online. It sets up a beautiful set of ideals that we really should be pursuing while ignoring the very world system of global capitalism and militarized sovereign nation states that defeats these goals. There can be no global ecological protection unless we create a planetary peace system to replace the war system. There can be no ecological protection unless we replace the capitalist system with a democratic eco-socialism premised on human dignity and the quality of life rather than on private profit and quantitative growth. Ratification of the Constitution for the Federation of the Earth. Finalized at Troya, Portugal in 1991 is in my view, our only practical option. It fulfills the rights given in Article 28 of the UN Universal Declaration by giving us a social and international order in which all the rights and freedoms of that declaration can be fully realized. It is also a thoroughly green constitution. It explicitly gives us the right to peace and to a protected planetary environment. By contrast with Article 2, of the Charter of Ecological Responsibilities, we must now ask how any government can, quote, protect the right of every individual to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment. That's what the Charter says, that every government must protect the right of every individual to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment. In truth, they cannot do this. This is structurally impossible under the system of militarized sovereign states. No government is able to protect even its own citizens' rights, let alone planetary environmental rights. This is because no government is independent of the world system of global capitalism and militarized sovereign nation states, a system that imposes limitations on the imperatives of any decision-making but governing body in the nation. Even the most powerful government cannot protect my rights to peace in a planetary and a healthy environment. These are global problems and global rights, but no nation is global. So how is it going to protect my right to a healthy environment? This fragmented system makes it impossible to protect holistic planetary rights of any sorts. If my nation attempts to protect the local environment, your nation remains free to destroy it. Planetary rights can only be protected by planetary government. Similarly, we can only become, quote, a global citizen, a global community acting in concert, unquote, if we politically, economically, culturally, and structurally become a global community. The Earth Constitution institutionalized human human beings as just such a global democratic community. The Earth Constitution is designed to protect our planetary rights that are beyond the scope of any and all nations. It gives us a world system in which the environment and our ecological rights are protected precisely because the system is designed to do this, right? Neither global capitalism nor the system of sovereign nation states is designed to protect rights. 
The present system is designed for private profit as well as perpetual war, and it defeats these rights at every turn and is actively destroying the environment. To fully realize the ideals expressed in the introduction and conclusion to the Charter of Ecological Responsibilities means to establish a world system designed to do this. And we will only become a global community acting in concert when we unite under a democratic constitution, making us into such a community. The Constitution for the Federation of Earth provides a template for an environmentally protected world system and for that global community that is necessary. The Charter of Ecological Responsibilities is an important document. It needs to get out there. We must also recognize the need for transcendence of our present failed fragmented world system that is implied by the ideals articulated in this charter. The charter powerfully implies the need for a democratic earth constitution uniting, uniting all of us under the principle of unity and diversity. Where the earth constitution founds democratic world law and universal human rights and planetary environmental integrity not on wealth and power and territorial boundaries. Here lies the key to a truly cooperative and sustainable human community. The Earth Constitution is implicitly called for by the Charter of Global Ecological Responsibilities. Thank you all for your attention.